In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So there was a pastor who decided he absolutely needed to take a Sunday off. And so he arranged to take the Sunday off, and he needed to go and be by himself in the wilderness. So he went hiking, and he was having a great hike. It was a beautiful day, and he was about two-thirds the way up the mountain, and all of a sudden he heard a rustling over in the distance, and he walked up, and he saw that it was a bear. So he started to run as fast as he could, but he realized the bear was faster than he was, so he dropped to his knees and did what came naturally. He prayed, and he prayed very specifically. He prayed that he hoped that the bear would find faith, would accept Christ, <laughs> And his surprise and relief, all of a sudden, he looked over and the bear got down on one knee and put his hands together, crossed himself, and said, bless this food to our use and us to thy service. <laughs> it took me over an hour on the internet to find a clean joke to tell. It's just... And since you're laughing, I'll tell you the one that was on the cutting room floor. <laughs> Similar topic. A priest at the very last minute calls in sick because it's such a beautiful day, decides it's a perfect day to go play golf. And so he goes out to the golf course and there's absolutely no one there because everybody's in church. And he sets up on the first tee and it's absolutely perfect for golf. And Peter's upstairs saying to God, you're not going to let him get away with this, are you? He says, don't worry about it, Peter. And so he swings back, and he nails it. I mean, the perfect drive, and everything falls into place. The wind is at his back. He catches an incredible roll. It keeps going into the hole, a 405-yard drive <laughs> into the hole. And Peter says to God, you let him have it? God says, who's he going to tell? <laughs> So why a joke on Easter Sunday? And it's not just because it's April Fool's Day, but I figured that's an appropriate time uh, to bring out a joke. Uh, but it's a 1,600-year-old tradition called the Paschal Joke. And we tell a joke to remind us that evil thought it had won. Evil thought it had it all wrapped up and in the bag, and the joke was on evil itself that goodness and love prevailed even over death. You know, maybe the practical joke is not the jokes that have been told, but maybe it's the joke that Mark tells. See, Mark writes this gospel account, and he ends it right there. Right where you think the story is just getting to its conclusion, he stops abruptly. Like he refuses to play the last note or write the last verse. In fact, it frustrated people so much that if you go to the Bible, you'll see that they actually added more to Mark. It says the shorter ending, and then there's more to it. And he ends it with, they were terrified. They were terrified. They were perplexed, and they were terrified, and they told no one. And if that truly was the end of the story, we wouldn't be here today. You know, it reminds me of this uh, priest in Louisville. He was this uh, Catholic priest in a very Catholic city, and he was absolutely beloved. He was a great storyteller, and he'd been in the, the, the area for about 30 years, and everybody knew, uh, knew him. And on uh, Christmas, his church filled like you've never seen a church. Thousands of people would come to his church. And so he got up, and he started telling the most incredible story, and he was weaving together every detail, and it was going perfectly, and it got to the point where everybody is at the edge of their seat. I'm sure you get that when I'm preaching, too. but it's a, uh, And then he just sits down. And then during the announcements, he says, oh, by the way, I'll finish the story next week to see how many people would be there the next Sunday. Uh, or maybe Mark is more like uh, this story, this, uh, this wife and mother of three with three young children around, and uh, she was married to an incredible man, an incredibly talented composer. Uh, but this composer had one difficult personality trait. 
he was great at what he did because he was relentless, because he was a perfectionist. And when he started composing, he couldn't stop until it was perfect. Sometimes that would be four or five in the morning. Uh, and all was great until they started having children. And uh, uh, if you've uh, been around in the morning, it's kind of a busy time. And she was losing it. She said, every morning I'm making three lunches, I'm getting breakfast, I'm getting kids out of bed, and he's just gone to sleep. We've got to change this. So he talks, she talks to him and says, come on, we got to do something. He says, that's what I do. That's what I do. I I, once the creative energy start going, I have to go until it's absolutely perfect. And she tried everything. She tried getting him to shut down way earlier, but nothing worked. Now, she also was a capable pianist. And so what she decided, she'd open all of the, uh, the doors in the house and she'd get on the piano and she'd play some of his favorite compositions. But she'd play all the way up to that last key. And then she'd just wash her hands and walk away. And he couldn't stand it. He got out of bed and he got down and got on the piano and finished the tune. And she said, well, you're up, honey. You know. <laughs> I think Mark is doing that to us. Is asking us to be part of the story, asking us to play the next note. Mark starts with Jesus' baptism as if inviting all of us, as we think about our own baptism, what does it mean? What's our role in the story? Are we in? Are we committed? And I talked uh, a lot during Lent and during Holy Week about seeing the cross differently this year, seeing the cross as I turn on the news and I see all of the, the, the barbs across uh, 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 pol uh, political lines, I see all of the reasons for anxiety and all the things that, uh, that seem out of sorts in the world. And I see that as one bar in the cross. And I see the other as God's love-drenched dream for us. And that those two on Good Friday collide. God's love and dream for the world to be more than it is collides with the harsh reality of the way that we sometimes are. And on Good Friday, those two are forever forged together. Light and darkness, the reality we live in, and the reality that could be. That shroud is torn in two, and that light and that truth and that vision, that dream that God has for us is never apart from the reality we live in. Easter is our assurance that that dream that God has for us wins, that love wins. As Martin Luther King said that the, uh, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it always bends towards justice. And I think what he means by that is that God always wins, that God's vision for the world, God's love-drenched vision for all of our lives eventually always wins. It may not look like it in the moment, but it always triumphs. I don't know what brought you here today. Some of you may be here uh, week in and week out. Some of you, this may be the first time you've ever been here. Some of you might have had something nudging at you to come. Some just said it's Easter, this is what we do. I'm more concerned with how we leave, how we walk out that door, how we finish Mark's story. The women truly gave in to their fears, truly gave in to the, the thought that, yeah, this might have worked fine for Jesus. He's the son of God. Of course, he gets lifted up. But what about me when I risk, when I fall? Will God lift me up? Did they trust that the story was true? Did it hold in their own lives? They truly went away and forgot it ever happened. We're not here. And I need to be here because I need to believe in a universe where love wins, where God is at the helm, where truth and light and goodness is the prevailing force in the universe. Father Randolph talked on Palm Sunday about Abraham Lincoln. There's another story about uh, Lincoln that's told, uh, and it was a little bit earlier in the story, as he's trying to hold the nation together amidst war, uh, and he says, I am not convinced about the abolition of slavery. 
He says, I feel as president my most important duty is holding together this union. And if it means that the best way to accomplish that is that all slaves go free, so be it. And if it means that no slaves go free, so be it. My primary responsibility is to hold together this union. And if it means some slaves go free and some do not, but it holds together the union, then that's my sworn oath. Frederick Douglass heard these words and he was despondent. He was having lunch with Sojourner Truth and it said that he was slouched over with his head in his hands saying, if Abraham Lincoln isn't on our side, then we have no hope. If Lincoln isn't for the abolition, abolition of slavery, full stop, then it's over. And he just had his hands there holding his head up. So General Truth said to him, Frederick, is God dead? Is God dead? And he said, no. No, God's not dead. And she said, so get up and do something. And he did. He got up and he proverbially stormed into Lincoln's office and he made his Easter claim that hope is alive, that love wins, and he changed the world. You all are here today for a myriad of reasons. You're here because hope won, because love won. But what are you going to do with that truth? What key are you going to play when you walk out that door are you going to be Easter people? Are you going to proclaim difficult truths? Are you going to shine light into dark places? Are you going to believe beyond all reasons not to? That that alleluia rings true. That light and love and goodness wins. We need that resistance. We need that defiant hope that goes out into the world and shines light. Be that ray of light. Be that alleluia. Be that final key to the song. Amen.